Let's just see, maybe to do. January 23rd. We have a section. Well, maybe this isn't good. <laughs> Forever, there used to be a link up here of things to do, which was like scheduled events that you could, they were usually pretty big, but there, there was also other stuff there. There, things to do, there it is. It's funny how when you search to do, it doesn't actually show up. Um, so, of course, some of these things would be outside of the scope of, of you know, what you're willing to follow up on. Um, so there are shows. Poetry Flash, I don't know. Chow, you're into spoken word. I'm not thinking that you might want to attend this or something, but are there any kinds of, you know, slams or open mics or anything that you ever go to that you might want to report on? I've done, like, I've read my poetry for an assignment. In school? In the anthology. Yeah, okay. That's spring. Okay. Well, I'm thinking there might be uh, there might be that type of event that you would be into attending. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, sometimes you're looking in here for specific events. Sometimes you're looking in here just for you know ideas of maybe smaller stuff. But you know, if you happen to know anyone who was appearing in a show or anything like that. Another place you could look for events would be in, in the Guardsman, which is, of course, a student newspaper, which is uh, full, of, um, full of interesting stuff. And you, there might be, <clears throat> you might find news of an upcoming event in the Guardsman that uh, would be interesting too. We're going to wind up talking about uh, this as well. So, so anyway, that's, you know, is still, is still a week or more that you can keep your ears open, Chow, and see if you can hear of anything that uh, might be coming up that you'd be interested in going to. It is streaming. Great. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we were just uh, putting our heads together about what kinds of events or... Um, maybe, maybe the City College sport games? That's a possibility to uh, attend a game with a particular angle, thinking about, you know, learning about what's at stake and what might happen. Yeah. So that could be something. You might also find that even you know, you're going to bring a couple of ideas to the day we all meet up and talk about our ideas. But sometimes there are people who are going to have suggestions at, at that meetup. I mean, that always happens is that somebody knows something that's going on. Oh, hey, you should check that out, you know, especially if they know what kind of thing you're interested in. Jonah? Um, so if it's, say there's like a, a radio show, that I want, would that be more of like an event or that would just be like you do a profile on the show? If it's like a weekly show, like yeah. kind of an event, but I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'd call that an event, but you know, you could also focus it around a particular personality, DJ or something, and then I guess it would be more of a profile. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, give some thought to that. Uh, meanwhile, you know, there's an extra credit assignment that uh, would be due on next Tuesday, September 4th, if you're interested in doing it. So uh, we talked about it last class, but since streaming didn't work out and perhaps, well, whatever, uh, it never hurts to repeat, whereas some information that could get you good grades and such. So uh, um, this fact-checking assignment 
uh, is uh, follows on with what we're talking about and learning about this week in the textbook in chapter two, which is uh, about the importance of accuracy. And uh, so this this fact checking assignment doesn't have you actually doing the job of a fact checker, but sort of doing the thinking that uh, leads up to that, which would be uh, to find uh, an objective news article in an actual newspaper like the Chronicle or the Guardsman. Um, so it could be online, could be on paper or whatever, uh, of, a, of a given length. And the one that I distributed here is a great example of that type of article. So this is uh, from uh, August 27th on, uh, you know, sort of the latest developments, um, kind of shocking developments in the ghost ship case, um, which has been through, uh, it's going through the courts right now. So uh, um, we can take a look at this. But this would be, a, you know, a great example of a, of a story that you could um, do for this little assignment. So the idea is find a story that's at least 300 words long that's in a reputable uh, source, like a newspaper. Um, you know, either print it out, cut it out, or have it on your screen, or whatever. Underline every detail in the story that a fact checker should be able to verify. Details include data, descriptions, assertions, quotations. Um, and you can go as deep with this as, as you want. Um, the types of assertions that uh, are the product of eyewitness reporting, so where the reporter was actually in attendance at a particular event or something, does not need to be fact-checked for this assignment. Um, you know, we're assuming that this is a reputable source. Uh, but the, the, the stuff which is secondary, which the reporter brings into it, uh, that would be fact-checkable. So what this asks you to do is, you know, write up a little list to, you know, even just number it out in your story. Here's an assertion, here's an assertion, here's an assertion. Number one, two, and three. And then uh, put that under a column. And then in the other column, write process of fact-checking. And just write down uh, how, you know, how would you go about fact-checking this particular uh, fact that's in the story. Um, and then see if, you know, don't go beyond like Google searching or such, but uh, see how far can you get in determining how would you find this out? You know, if, uh, if it's somebody in the mayor's office, can you find them on the website? Uh, if it's a fact that that person is putting forward, you know, can you find their contact information that you would want to just verify with them? Uh, uh, if, for instance, the quote that you've got is actually, you know, um, what they intended to say, uh, that it hasn't been taken out of context or something. So again, you don't have to call them, but just go through, go through the effort of, uh, you know, seeing what should be fact-checked and then uh, taking steps as to how you would go about fact-checking it. Um, so see, see if that interests you. And then there's an example down here. Um, where, you know, the types of things that could be fact-checked. How many murders does Philadelphia have in a day? Call the police department or the DAs to try to get the statistics, um, et cetera. And then, you know, they found the phone number to call. And that's it. You don't call, but that's, that's the start. So questions about that, if you feel like doing it, you know. Um, okay. Terrific. So, Joe? Tuesday we meet at Yeah, Tuesday, well, we're going to meet here and we'll all go over there. Yeah, because we never know, you know, it's the best thing is for us to meet up and go over there. So on Tuesday, we're going to meet up here and then go over to the radio club meeting. And it'll be a good opportunity to show you around a radio station as well. Uh, because coming up, we're writing for the radio. And then um, the next mini assignment that's coming up for credit this time on uh, Tuesday, September 11th, so not this coming Tuesday, the Tuesday after, we're going to write some short radio news scripts. So um, we may even kind of dip into that today so that because on Tuesday we won't have time really to talk too much about it. So that would mean it would go to next Thursday before we have it. And that would, you know, it's not going to leave you too much time. 
They're very short pieces of writing, but it's kind of the first for credit thing that we'll be doing. So let's talk about that a little later today. First, let's just take a look at what um, our textbook is telling us about, uh, about fact checking and such. And I think I also like the youth radio fact checking tip sheet as well. Let's download that. That's a very good resource. So let's open that up. And, OK, that's good. So there's some great tips there, very practical stuff. Uh, yeah. The textbook is, uh, the textbook gets really good starting in the next chapter. So we'll have this one today, anyway. Um, boom, come on, open up. It is open. While that is sitting there bouncing around, I think I also had, uh, It's supposed to be open, right? Did anybody, uh, what is the latest sort of internet hoax or false news, fake news item that you remember hearing about that uh, people fell for? Any good ones you can remember? Anyone remember this one? The protesters, anti-Trump protesters bust into uh, an event. Uh, turned out there were buses, but there was like no event. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't come. They, they were there for like a computer, uh, some kind of computer conference or something. Uh, it didn't have to do with, you know, bussing in anti-Trump people to a rally at all. Well, I, I don't know. I think you will really enjoy this article if uh, you like to see a very thorough narrative of how fake news basically starts. So um, in this one, Eric Tucker, marketing company owner in Austin, Texas, sees a bunch of buses parked. And he knows that there's a Trump rally where there's been a lot of negative protesters. Puts two and two together, takes a bunch of pictures of the buses, and then tweets out that anti-Trump protesters in Austin today, uh, here are the buses they came in. So um, he basically never talked to anybody on the buses, anything like that. Just took the bus pictures, made that assumption. Honestly, it appears, like not not, hey, we'll fool these people, but wow, this is like, this is proof. Sent that out. And then uh, just really interesting reporting here kind of follows through. So, you know, uh, what happens first of all? Uh, somebody picks it up and posts it in Reddit. And people in Reddit start discussing it like crazy. Uh, then out of Reddit, which is being monitored by various, you know, sort of right-wing websites, they pick that up. Uh, breaking. They found the buses. Dozens lined up just blocks away from the Austin protests. So this is going to be proof that these were not, you know, real organic protesters, but, you know, were bussed in in order to give the impression that there were people against us. Uh, <laughs> Then it goes to other right-wing red sites and Facebook pages. There's, this is a Facebook page. Um, then there's some attempts at uh, uh, debunking this. And so people have been calling up. You notice that one of those buses had a prominent logo on it. So people are calling up the bus company saying, is this true? Why, you know, or why have you been doing this? And the bus company says, no, no, you know, we looked it up. We rented those buses to like a computer conference. It had nothing to do with the, we never had anything to do with that. Uh, so this was a reporter actually at the Fox television station in Austin. And uh, so the reporter gets, you know, that kind of refutation, gets that fact, uh, but that doesn't go very far. Um, Gateway Pundit picks it up. So what does it say here? Shared on Facebook more than 44,000 times, and they link George Soros to it, who's you know prominent uh, 
funder of liberal causes and a real uh, boogeyman in the right-wing media. That, you know, he's like, viewed as the bankroller of the liberal conspiracy and such. Uh, so all of this gets kind of wrapped up in, <laughs> in a ball. And uh, so just really interesting, very well documented story about how, you know, uh, the stuff bounces back and forth from different media. And once it gets going, even when it gets fact checked by a reporter, right, even from a Fox station, a reporter, it's hard to push back against the, you know, the, the viral tide that's pushing a story like that. So, interesting stuff. So what do you think about that? What could be done to counteract that? Is it a bad thing that this false story got out there? Yeah? yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's bad. I'm not really sure what you really do to prevent a fake article like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, it kind of comes from journalistic integrity, which is, uh, I guess, at the discretion of the distributor. That's interesting. OK. There's a lot in there William, we could unpack, for sure. And yeah? Eric Tucker, is, is he, just, he just has a, is he a tweeter? Or He's just a guy. Yeah, just a guy who happened to see it. But it, sometimes that gives you like an eyewitness credibility as well, you know? Jonah? Um, I feel like, yeah, I don't know if there's really anything you can do. I feel like people just pay way too much attention to like things they see on Twitter. And then, mm. I mean, Reddit is kind of like a very, like, I feel like sparks like get lit pretty quickly. <laughs> Like, well said, good metaphor. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like the one because Reddit's like more of um, a blog kind of platform. Where right. Where like a hub where I can just talk about in, in miscellaneous fame. I know it's because I've done that. Have you? Well, I, I haven't really typed on it, but I look on like Flipper and stuff. Like recently, I looked up George's Bizarre Adventure on Reddit. Okay, okay. That'll be a story for another time. Right. So, so. I, I, you know, I agree with a certain pessimism about disrupting the viral tide or whatever I called it, which is, you know, once something like this gathers steam, it's hard to stop it. But I, I want to dwell on William's remark that, you know, it comes down to, to journalistic integrity. And then Jonah saying, you know, people pay way too much attention to a tweet. I think there's two sides there to that. There's, there's the responsibility of the communicator, of the person you know, obviously Eric Tucker, I, I have a feeling he probably came to regret it or, you know, the, the, what he'd started there. Certainly other people, um, for instance, this story here references the, uh, uh, the incident where uh, another right-wing hoax story was that uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, I think, had a child uh, slavery ring run out of a pizzeria in Washington. And a person who believed that story went with a, a gun. Uh, and said he was self-investigating the story and wound up shooting his gun in the restaurant, of course. It was like absolutely ludicrous, but I, you know, so some of the people who are, you know, like, I, I don't think they, they actually intend for this to happen, but, but it does happen. So number one, the journalistic integrity, which is, you know, try, try to tell the truth. Um, and, and obviously, you know, some, some websites are in the business of uh, putting forward fake news. It's, Absolutely. So, so you, I think you got to be pretty. You, know, you got to you got to doubt the credibility of, of any you know site or source, and and so your responsibility as you you know report for this class or report for uh, uh, you know as a communicator, even if you're out there tweeting, I think is hopefully you're going to try to tell the truth, and do you know at least the next step of, of Eric Tucker, which is see a bus go ask the bus driver who hired them or, you know, because, or see someone get off the bus, find out what's going on, which would typically be the uh, reflex of a reporter. But, you know, in this day and age, we've got entry into the media by everybody, citizen reporters, quote unquote, amateurs, you know, people with varying degrees of sophistication or, 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 or sense of responsibility about what they're doing. So, I think given that we're all able to participate now as creators and reporters, we should all have, like William's saying, a, a measure of, of journalistic integrity or just trying to tell the truth when we, and be accurate when we do stuff. Jonah, what did you want to say? I was going to say just like, 
off that and then just like integrity of just like people posting on like the internet and like trying to tell the truth like and just believing tweets way too much or like what you see on social media like when the whole uh, Nia Wilson thing happened was that last month tell me about it I, I don't know if I was aware of it the, the girl got stabbed coming off of the park no I wasn't here I was away in the summer what yeah, happened well, well this lady just got stabbed like just random like stabbing on like Bart, but the guy who got arrested had like other crimes and someone like on my, I saw this on my Instagram feed that was like, he just got arrested for like petty theft because you can like look up who like inmates that come in. I see. And then I was like, well, there's no way like he was like, because they knew who did it. And then like, I just like, you just can look it up, right? Like the same website he looked up and the person had literally just taken a picture without putting in like the fact that like he really was like in there for like first degree murder or whatever. Whoa. Oh. So it's just like, you can really just like, bend a story, even if it's like, you know, just like to rile people up or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. to make it like more inflammatory, the fact that like, why it was like, you know, he just arrested for that when it was really like something a lot worse. Yeah. Just, like, you know, Amazing, yeah. Just like take a picture of anything, like even if it is like the truth and just like leave out one like piece of like information and it changed the whole. Yeah, whole yeah. That speaks to how hard it is to, you know, as much as we'd like to be able to put our finger on the truth or, or you know just trust every source or something there's all kinds of possibilities for distortion and omission I mean it's it's kind of like a it's a value it's something you aspire to without guaranteed that you'll be able to always you know get the facts right tell the true story but you know I mean part of being in the professional media is that they make corrections and uh, they admit that they get stuff wrong and you know you look on any major paper like the Chronicle or the Times and probably the Guardsman does it too. They'll print corrections, you know, quite prominently. We change this about the story and sometimes it's just like getting a name wrong or a date wrong, but they'll print that and say it, you know, versus other sites. It's like God knows what they put up there and then it's down a week later and it's just replaced with, you know, the next thing, you know. So I guess the, the flip side of what William's talking about is, you know, the audience has to be sophisticated. That's the other thing, you know. Uh, uh, it, it's people wouldn't spread these types of stories if they really thought critically about what they're reading. You know? So a few of these, uh, our, our textbook even again it takes the position that we're we're writers, we're reporters and such. But there's a couple of extras up here, same same page of canvas where I uh, posted that brilliant New York Times, you know, uh, narrative of how a story, a fake story, goes viral. So this is from NPR. 2016, you know, things were already getting pretty hot there in terms of fake news and stuff. And it, it provides recommendations about how the audience can, you know, be more critical and, uh, uh, you know, sift through what's out there. And uh, there are a lot of techniques uh, put forward here and really I'm designing a media literacy class and, you know, we'll definitely, I would, I would uh, try to integrate a lot of these ideas into the class. It's, it's a little outside of what we want to do as, um, as, as, as people in a writing class. But, you know, some things that are recommended here. Uh, so pay attention to the domain and the URL. Like track down the uh, source of the story and take a look at it and see, you know, where it's coming from. And sometimes here there are even sort of fakes. You know, the, the domain will try to try to to uh, sound like a legitimate news organization, but it's not. It's just off, hoping that people will not notice that. And then try to find out what you can about a website as well. Uh, there's uh, a number of things uh, related to it. I think um, there's some pretty specific stuff here, but if, if you land on a website with um, really lousy layouts, uh, a lot of spelling mistakes, strange formatting. It kind of shows you already that, hey, this is, there's not a lot of money or effort behind this. So they probably don't have a lot of editors, fact checkers, and reporters doing actual original reporting. If they could afford that, they would probably afford a better looking online presence, you know, or someone would actually be there like reading up on the spelling mistakes and stuff like that. If it's melodramatic and seems overblown, I mean, you know, if it's full of, adjectives like you know amazing enormous awesome outrageous you know although outrageous is like every second word that comes out of the white house <laughs> that's an outrageous claim yeah. uh, so so check the language you know is it over the top 
uh, looking at quotes in the stories, um, especially if it's controversial, stories should have quotes from multiple sources. You know, we were discussing that in here, saying that eventually we're going to build up our reporting to have at least a couple of sources. Uh, but you would expect professional media that's responsibly made to have numerous sources and to actually quote them. Uh, a sure sign of someone, you know, sitting in their basement at 2 a.m., like just writing up whatever screed is, you know, they're not going to have that type of stuff. Again, because they didn't actually talk to anybody involved. Uh, they're, they're, you know, quite likely making it up, you know. Um, look at the people who are quoted or the sources, if there are. You know, are they actually talking to experts, you know, or are they talking to people who are more like ideologues who, who you know, they have, they have a, a position already established on something without knowing too much about the specifics. You know? so, so you want to see if what you're reading is actually being sourced well, because typically what we would do, you know, um, when I ask you on your reporting projects, uh, for instance, uh, when we move it to the web and we have so much more space, one of my suggestions is, can you find out more context about this? Can you find out, you know, for instance, uh, how, you know, to come back to the organic farmer's market or story or whatever, it's like, how many farmer's markets are there out there? What kinds of, you know, what kind of uh, economic impact is it having? How much of the grocery business is, is, is actually involved? To give us a sense of impact, you know, is how important is what we're writing about? But also, you know, to bring the voices of people who actually know this stuff in there. You know, so if you have a chance to, you know, uh, uh, you know, call a professor uh, in in uh, uh, in agronomy or you know uh, UC Davis or uh, to talk to a food distributor or something like that, that would be, you know, those would be relevant experts. And when you look and you see that there's nothing like that, then you know that this is not really re reliable stuff. Uh, reverse image search, that's a good one. I hadn't even thought of that where, you know, uh, fake news often, you know, you got to have a picture associated, but you didn't have a photographer. You weren't actually there. You actually have nothing. Uh, so you go in Google Images and you grab an image and then you put it on your website. Well, you know, here it says, you know, uh, uh, if the image is appearing in a lot of stories about many different topics, there's a good chance it's not actually an image of what it says it was on the first story. So, you know, uh, you can find out that, hey, you know, that'll definitely give you a sign that a lot of this stuff is, is not credible. So um, if we all did that kind of thing when we encountered a story, instead of just, you know, hit share, uh, certainly things would be a lot better. And we wouldn't have that kind of, you know, viral tide uh, that would happen where, you know, a story with no credibility just takes off and finds a very willing and, you know, easy to fool public, you know, so. So, uh, well, there's my, there's my speech for uh, um, responsible reporting and uh, responsible audience uh, participation in media, I guess. You know? So let's look at what uh, the textbook tells us about um, about being accurate, relying on facts, indeed. While at the same time as we remember, we're going to be trying to write conversationally and not so technically that your audience is, you know, left behind uh, because there's so much detail in your story and stuff. So, um, there are some learning objectives. Uh, And yeah, one thing I like about the chapter is that, you know, it brings it down as, even to issues of basics of like getting, getting mistakes out of spelling and math uh, because that makes you look kind of not credible. And so while fact checking might involve getting on the phone and finding some stuff out or searching, Google searching. It also is just the first level of it is just making sure you have names right, you, you know, you're spelling stuff right. So uh, following on from uh, our first uh, week where we were talking about the importance of the audience, is 
never forget that what you're doing there is providing, you know, providing a service to the audience. So telling them fake stuff, they may be finding it emotionally gratifying. I guess that's a service, but uh, you're you're feeding them false information, which is a definitely a disservice. Um, and uh, uh, bad information really will immediately sap the credibility of any news organization. So. Uh, uh, for instance, we've had students coming out of uh, uh, BIMA who have gone to do the KLW, um, um, what do they call it, Academy. So uh, that's uh, one of our great public radio stations has a program of interns who work at the station for I think like eight months or so. And uh, they do their own reporting and they, you know, the first week or two, they have, they have a serious meeting uh, with uh, editorial staff at the at the radio station, where they just try to impress upon them the importance of you know being accurate, uh, and because anything you do on behalf of the station that turns out to you know um, to not be good uh, impacts on the work of everybody. You know, uh, if KALW loses credibility as a news source. Um, you know, sooner or later they'll lose their audience and then they'll lose their support base, which for public radio is, keeps them alive by paying for the whole thing. So, uh, so, so the first couple of weeks is just spent really emphasizing, you gotta do your job responsibly. And, and so, so it is, we speak here of the bond of trust with your readership. Do your best to present accurate information. So as soon as you start messing around, they may not believe you. And of course, this is why some high profile um, mistakes and missteps are dealt with really severely in, uh, in, in you know, professional media circles. So the New York Times has had instances of um, journalists who make stuff up. Uh, the New Republic had a famous one, and there's a uh, there's a there's a, um, a feature film out there. I can't remember the name of it, but it's all about basically the uncovering of this fellow who was like completely making up stuff, like, you know, writing 1,500 words reports on things that never happened. Um, there's plagiarizing. Uh, Farid Zakaria, who's a big time CNN commentator. Uh, was eventually, um, uh, you know, had to deal with accusations that were proven of plagiarization, of plagiarizing stuff, um, and so on and so forth. So there are missteps in big, big league media that result in, you know, at the times the editor, as well as the journalist, had to resign. You know? So it's dealt with quite quite harshly because, uh, um, you know, the trust in these organizations is, is super important. So uh, here are some places to verify information. Source documents. Whenever possible, get copies of original documents so you can compare what people have told you with what someone wrote. So that is good advice. And that's where the web can shine because, you know, you can provide links to source documents uh, in the web that are, you know, um, really convenient for readers to read. So whether it's links at the bottom of the story or embedded links in the story, uh, that's really useful. Um, we'll take a look in a few weeks at NBC Investigative, which is, you know, the San Jose NBC affiliate specializes in longer television reports, five to seven minutes, which is pretty long for TV. And uh, they'll, they'll spend, you know, two, three weeks on a story versus a station like KTVU might spend a day on a story, typically. They'll report it in depth, and then they'll put it up on the website in, in uh, a different form, and they always are supplying tons of links to the underlying information sources and, and data that they've got. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, original documents in TV can often just be, they show you a five second picture of a bunch of, you know, court case stuff. But once you hit the web, it can really be useful and important. Um, the story that I passed out, you know, uh, on the ghost ship trial, 
Uh, there's a couple of things in there that you would see, but most of the new information from the story uh, in this story is identified uh, uh, f that it's the source is from court documents. So in the first paragraph here, it says the judge who scrapped a plea deal in the ghost ship case cheated defendant Derek Almena out of his negotiated sentence, reneged on a promise and could not be impartial because he had lost a child, Almena's lawyers said Monday in court documents. That is a really crappy first sentence for radio, right? However, it's perfect for print. It's got you know, a lot of important information in it. The main thing is it's also telling us that this is from court documents. So you could go and look up the court documents and actually see what they say in there. Uh, there are also links throughout the story. If you look on page, you know, turn over, look on page two. There's links uh, in July in middle paragraph. Jacobson appeared to accept the plea bargain. Uh, so there's four hyperlinks on page two, which lead out to other chronicle stories on the same stuff. And so uh, there's the web really working for you to, uh, you know, in, in case you would like to find out you know, what specific parents had spoken up at the sentencing uh, hearing where the plea bargain was first floated and to find out the awful things that they said there. We're talking about having to see the corpse of their child burned to death and things like that. Um, you can, you know, click through to that, to that story and, and find out, uh, you know, much more. So, all of this is building as rich a picture as you want to have of what's going on, but also credibility, you know, and, uh, and of course the Chronicle is, is a very credible source. And let me just, um, by the way, for the people who are tuning in, let me just give them a link to this, uh, to this story so that they can follow along. Chronicle, that's the story. And let me copy this and drop it into chat. Oh, thank you. Randy is telling us that the movie about a uh, famous plagiarist at the New Republic, I think, which is a conservative uh, magazine, uh, it was Stephen Glass was a reporter, and the, uh, the, the film is Shattered Glass. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Randy. And now here, for you folks who are in chat who just want to see the article that we're talking about here, there's, there's the link to it. Awesome. So um, where were we at? <laughs> Sorry. Many, many balls afloat, right? Um, We'll look at this in a little. I don't want to let too much time pass before we actually look at this, but uh, let's let's plow through a few more slides. So uh, they were talking about um, some places to verify information. Look for those source documents. Uh, Dead Tree Publications. Um, you know, it's relatively easy to start up a website and and uh, populate it with news uh, that you get from other places. Uh, it's a lot more of an investment to, you know, make a dead tree publication, print a book or a newspaper. Uh, you can assume there's more capital there. You can assume that there's a bigger workforce. And, uh, you know, of course, there, uh, there's a long history of partisan newspaper uh, work. So we're not saying just because it's in a newspaper, it's not uh, biased or spun. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a bigger organization behind it. Um, so there's a recommendation there. Going to .gov or .edu websites um, may lead you to organizations that are uh, more responsible, that, that try to be more uh, uh, objective. And so um, <clears throat> certainly, you know, again, the advice of, that we had from NPR to look at the domain, uh, that this, this follows on with that. Um, and so a lot of this can be kind of conducted through Google and, and you know, trying to find out what are the specific organizations that are also uh, associated with this. So for instance, even me, who's developing a course on media literacy, that one of the first things I do is I find out, you know, the names of the academic associations or sort of 
sub-disciplines that deal with media literacy and find you know, their official websites, their Facebook pages and stuff like that to sort of start getting a sense of who, you know, who are the thought leaders in this area and uh, you know, what are the trends that I should be aware of as I make my course and things like that. So looking for those official organizations is something that, that you want to do. You can get you know, some really kind of marginal site that is giving you information, which is you know, really you know, just the, a single viewpoint of a single person. Um, not as interesting as finding an official site. Uh, sometimes, if you're lucky enough to be a reporter on a beat, you, know, you become the expert on the topic. Uh, and I would expect, I don't know, I didn't click through to all of those other links, but I bet you that Kimberly Vecleroff at the Chronicle has written on the case, the ghost ship case before. So that, that just makes it so much more convenient uh, to a reporter who's probably got several things on the go at once to, uh, you know, to, to jump in and, and write a story like this and, and know, you know there were those three or four pieces we published last week or the last month. So you become a, uh, an authority, um, but you, know, you also want to check yourself sometimes. So here we go, basic fact checking. Uh, it can take a significant amount of time if you do it right. And in a sense, you know, I mean, I see a lot of people looking at that extra credit assignment going, is this worth it? Because this is going to take me a couple hours. Yeah. And that's without even uh, um, actually you know, calling the people up to do the verification. Uh, but here, you know, they point out that it's really important just to go through line by line. First kind of first level of it is to read what you write, eliminate your spelling mistakes, uh, think about, you know, did I get those people's names and, and titles correct? Verify that. Sometimes you can get it from their official websites and such. Sometimes you may have to call them and verify that again. As I said, as broadcasters, a great thing to do is when you start rolling on them for the interview that you've done or whatever, ask them to state their name, spell their name, say their institutional title. So that way you can just go to your tape and you have it already from them. Um, so yeah, and go through, and, and uh, this is hard because once you've written something, you really just want to get it out. But you know, reading what you've written, trying to you know, put on a different hat and say, OK, would everybody who's reading this see it the way that I see it? Is, you know, or did I, did I say this in a way that could be misinterpreted? You know, so that's something to look through. Uh, proper nouns. Uh, you know. Um, Places, the names of publications, stuff like that. So, you know, um, Washington State, the state of Washington, you know, so uh, are, like, how are you using capitalization? Again, Google can help you for that. Uh, official websites can help you with that. Um, and style guides for your particular profession or publication will help you with that. So the AP style guide, which is kind of the Bible for print and broadcast uh, style, uh, will give you a lot of rules about how to uh, capitalize things. And we actually have a condensed version of the AP style guide, like just a 15-page you know, little thing that's up on the module for next week. So we can look at that. Uh, but um, that's, that's another thing to just, a simple thing to pay attention to. but. That's, uh, I think, you know, it's pretty important. Um, where is that? I had opened up. Uh, there it is. So this is also available on, the, uh, on our Canvas site for this week. So this is from Youth Radio over in the East Bay. But they, um, they, they give you kind of a bunch of different types of facts, suggestions about, you know, how to fact check them. Um, so names and titles, you could look on their official website. Uh, if they don't have an official website, you could call and try to find out. So place names, this is what we were just talking about. Again, you know, look on particular place. You know, I noticed, for instance, that the Chronicle uh, does, you know, when they talk about the Richmond or the sunset, they do not capitalize the the, but they just capitalize so the place names. So that's their particular 
uh, style that they use. So know that for your organization, or if your organization doesn't have specific guidelines, use the AP that we'll see with just you know the basic thing that we all know, which is that proper nouns should be capitalized. You know, uh, um, so continue on. Numbers and statistics, just try to add them up, make sure that they actually do add up, that someone hasn't dropped a zero somewhere or something, which is sometimes that happens. Um, contact information listed in a story, try to check out, make sure that's right, look at their website. If there's a phone number, it says double check phone numbers by calling to make sure that they work, so um, that, that could be useful. Actually, I'm just reminded, uh, I, I, was, um, I was a reference for one of our students who wanted to do an internship at a media organization, and I don't have an office phone, so I gave my cell phone. And uh, so the person from that organization was gonna call up to ask me for a reference for the student. They first called my department because that was the official phone number, because, right? So they weren't gonna, I, the only phone number I gave them was my cell phone. But they figure, well, this could be any guy giving us his number. So first they call my department and say, is the teacher here? Yes, okay, so they hear from my department, they confirm that I actually am who I am, then they call me on the cell phone. I thought that was pretty vigilant, you know? I thought, oh yeah, these are, these are reporters who are actually doing this. So that was cool. Um, references to dates, oh, gender pronouns, you wanna check that with people. Uh, quotations, so you know many times a quotation doesn't need a follow-up if uh, it comes from a direct reporting. Many editors ask their reporters actually to supply notes, like when they turn in a story, they've written it up, they'll say, yeah, can I also have like the, you know, everything you've got on that particular meeting? Sometimes just to check and make sure that, you know, uh, everything was there, but also just to get the context for you're picking out little quotes and sound bites. So they want to make sure that you know you're actually not lifting out a quote which seems like it, the exact opposite of what was meant at the time. Um, so um, you don't really need to check whether they said if or and or something like that at the time, although that could be important. But more just about you know, does this fit with overall what the subject was trying to tell you? You didn't just pick something out of context and twist it, because we know that that's a very common thing for fake news to do, just lift something out and pretend that it's, that it's completely different. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, this is a really useful thing. I would print it out and keep it with you for future jobs and stuff, because, um, you know, it's, it's super practical compared to, whoops, and subscribe to the Chronicle. Support good, good journalism. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, uh, we don't want to go too far with this. Let's see, review your property. Look into the numbers, we said. Kind of check, make sure the math checks out. Check into places. Um, double trust. Yeah. There's actually, uh, uh, not in this story, but there was a map in the Chronicle, which is made things pretty interesting. Um, okay, so just a few more ideas to burst, run through there because we want to talk about other stuff. But uh, Very important thing to do as we get into writing. It, it'll, it'll sound like it makes a better, sometimes you're, don't say what you don't know. Stick to what people told you. And if there are holes there, which often happens, it gets frustrating. You know, you, you have to do the, make the effort to find somebody who can fill those holes in for you. You can't, you can't do it yourself. So only say what you know for sure, even if it makes your story seem less impactful, less interesting at the time. Um, that's, that's where, you know, you start going wrong. And find more than one good source for key facts. So, you know, again, as a consumer of news or as a reporter who's looking at something, it's like, you know, if it's, if it seems to have one of the foci, one of those impactful, or it's something with out of the ordinary oddity, you know, you're not the only one who's going to think that. So look around. Have other people been talking about this? Is this, you know, 
Is it reported on elsewhere or is this just there's only one source for this and no one else seems to have heard of it? And that if that's the case, then your, you know, your, your uh, antenna should come up. It's like, is this, really, is this really real? Is this really working? Okay. Oh, there we go. Hoaxes and myths, right? You want to avoid them. Cool. So that was the content of the chapter anyway. And, and we've been trying to impress just the importance of being accurate and, and um, uh, accurate as a producer of news or of information and smart, skeptical, and uh, 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 you know, uh, committed to going beyond just believing everything you see, but following through and finding out, is this true, is this real? You know, so doing your own bit of fact checking as a, as a reader. Cool. OK. Um, let's just dip into chat, see any news. OK, Paul's saying thank you there. All right, so let's take, a, take another look at the, the ghost ship story. Um, so hopefully you had a chance just to read it over. It's a complex story. Uh, What's always useful, like something like this, is if, if you were going to take this news item and try to write it up uh, as a brief radio news item, which is what our upcoming assignment will be asking you to do, to pick, pick a couple of newspaper articles and then rewrite them, use the facts from them, but rewrite them as you would for radio. You know? So. Uh, um, this is uh, almost, well, this is a good two pages long if you take out the photograph. So uh, that's probably about 500 words or close to it, three to 500. So there's a lot in there. Um, the, uh, the specific situation, well, first of all, um, we all know what the ghost ship was, right? The, the artist residence burned, many people died. Um, so this has been working its way through the courts and we, this, this story is covering, you know, a pretty complicated set of events, which was that, um, uh, you know, th they're at a stage in the, uh, in the process where the defendants have entered a, a plea deal. Look, they're looking for a plea deal. They're looking to plead guilty to uh, a kind of a reduced sentence rather than have it go to trial. And um, uh, they were working with one judge who um, started the case off and then uh, passed it on to a second judge uh, who would have been uh, Judge Jacobson. And um, while Judge Jacobson was um, in charge, a plea bargain was floated that was acceptable to the judge, the defendants, and the prosecutors. Uh, however, uh, when it came, you know, when that, that bargain had to be uh, ratified in open court and the, uh, uh, the survivors of many of the victims were present on that day, and Judge Jacobson had returned, cut, you know, uh, responsibility for the trial over to the original judge, Judge Kramer, who, when all the parents uh, had the opportunity to speak at the plea bargain, felt that, you know, the, uh, the bargain that had been struck, which would have been about, I think, two to three years of jail time for uh, the key tenant, uh, that it was too lenient. He felt that so many people had suffered and they were so outraged that he um, rejected the plea bargain himself. And so uh, um, at this, at the juncture when this article is written, the, uh, the defendant's lawyers have um, called foul and basically have entered new court documents saying that, you know, um, uh, their client is being cheated, that the, they had come to a plea bargain with Judge Jacobson, an agreement, uh, Judge Kramer had returned. Judge Kramer is apparently uh, uh, biased because he lost a child of his own, and he mentioned this to one of the prosecutors 
uh, and they, you know, are saying that he's therefore, you know, not, he's got a conflict of interest. He's, he's, he's uh, too easily swayed by the survivors and stuff. So uh, there you go. That took like two, three minutes to tell. <laughs> so you'd really want to work hard to kind of uh, reduce the complexity of this story. And so it's a great story for print because of that complexity. Uh, but let's look at the structure of the story. So it's got a headline, Ghost Ship Suspect Demands That Plea Deal Be Reinstated. And that's a nice newspaper headline. It's, uh, you know, it's not clickbaity, definitely not. It's very informative. Um, you know, so good headline, that sets up the story for us. In, in radio or television journalism, we don't have a headline, basically. The closest we have is maybe an anchor person who sets a story up, you know. But they're likely to say something more like, uh, you know, uh, uh, more on the story of the ghost ship trial coming up. Uh, you know, Eric has our uh, news on this, and then they'll go over to a reporter. So we don't really have headlines. So we've got to think about how we can get the headline information into, uh, into a broadcast story. Uh, and then let's look at the actual story as written in print, OK? Um, so print stories as broadcast stories, they start off with per what's perhaps the most important part of any story, uh, the lead. Or sometimes it's written like that. But um, I tend to write it like that. So the lead is the first paragraph or two of a story, which is designed to be uh, informative, especially in print. Uh, and in, in broadcasting, informative, but maybe more important, engaging, intriguing. Trying to get people to, hey, wake up, listen to this. This is an interesting or important story. So uh, the lead is uh, your first sentence or two, or first paragraph or two. So I already read out the lead in this story. The judge who scrapped a plea deal in the ghost ship case cheated defendant Derek Almena out of his negotiated sentence, reneged on a promise, and could not be impartial because he had lost a child, Almena's lawyer said Monday in court documents. Okay. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a good lead for print, bad lead for broadcasting, I'd say. Um, in print, um, there are different types of leads. In print, this would be called a blind lead uh, because we don't actually know the name of the judge who's the first named, the first thing up in the sentence, basically. We learn that in the second paragraph. Uh, so it's, that's an interesting type of lead. But typically, in uh, an informative print-based lead, we would want to have you know, the who, what, where, when, and maybe the why and the how, but that usually comes later in the story, in the body of the story. So who, what, where, and when, we want to hear. And so here we know that it's the judge. We know uh, we know when. It's Monday. We know that we're hearing this from court documents. Um, so that's a, that's a fair chunk. Uh, and if we move into the second paragraph, which in, in print um, is you know, part of the lead usually, the motion submitted to the Alameda County Superior Court, so we've got the where, argues that Judge James Kramer, so now we know the actual name of the first judge anyway, essentially breached a contract when he vetoed the plea agreement this month. The filing asks that the rejected deal and the jail sentences it contained be reinstated. All right. So, and then the issue will be argued during a hearing November 2nd in Oakland, the next one. All right. So uh, we can see that with the addition of the second paragraph, which usually will flesh out what's in the lead, um, we find out the rest of the basic information that uh, we need to know about the story. And then as we go on, um, we can learn, you know, we can learn more and more. Um, so informationally, we've got really all we need in these one, two, and the third paragraph. 
to do something like make a short 30 second kind of news item for uh, radio. Uh, of course, we got so much more coming on in, in the rest of the story, which is appropriate for print or for a longer radio uh, report. But um, what we just want to look at here, I think, is um, some ideas about how to take the information out of a print lead and turn it into a, a story for radio. You know? um, so the first thing that we want to do is uh, to make our lead engaging in that sense in a broadcast way. So it doesn't have to be as informative as, uh, as, as a, an informational lead for a print story. Um, we're looking more for something engaging. So uh, can you guys come up with, uh, a, you know, what, what, would, what, what would be a, a sort of a first phrase that would orient listeners to this? What, what, what are we talking about in this, uh, in this story? So the first sentence on the... Uh, articulates that we're talking about the judge in relation to the ghost ship and then also identifying the other subject in the in the story of the, the defendant yeah yeah so let's say that maybe in print it's okay we're starting with the judge uh, but I would probably say okay we've got that information there but let's turn it around and start with you know the the more active parties which in this case are Almena's lawyers who are, you know, so instead of starting on the judge who scrapped a plea deal in the ghost ship case, cheated defendant Derek Almena out of his negotiated sins, maybe we could say, you know, uh, um, in the ghost ship case, lawyers for the defendant Almena uh, argued or, 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 yeah, uh, argued today that the judge had cheated them out of a negotiated plea deal, something like that. So my advice is based here on let's simplify this and let's put, you know, the people who are driving this story, let's start with them and put them in the driver's seat. So however we would want to, you know, eventually massage the information, you know, we would say, uh, you know, lawyers or, you know, uh, we want to, yeah, lawyers for the defendants. Let's let's keep the blind lead. Lawyers for the defendants in the ghost ship trial argued Monday that the judge had cheated them out of a plea deal. Okay, this, this could all be revised. You never want to go with the first thing you write. But um, I think this is more appropriate for broadcasting. Again, you're starting with kind of the subject of the sentence, the people who are driving this part of the story. Uh, notice that they have put cheated in quotation marks here. They're following kind of the advice uh, of, you know, good print journalism, which is, you know, that's a loaded word. And we want to show that we are uh, responsible journalists by saying that that word actually comes from the lawyers. You don't have to worry about that in broadcasting because most of what I said, most of what we say is more conversational. It's so, and of course, we can't put air quotes or anything around it when it's on the air. So I think it's totally, you know, legit to keep a word like cheated, and, and we don't, I don't think, need to worry in broadcasting about avoiding that type of language, at least not too much. Um, so what do you guys think about this, apart from that? Do you see some, do you, should we revise it in some ways? Do you think it has some weaknesses to start with? Okay. What, so what else would we want to say, let's say, in a second paragraph, a second, or a second sentence, really? Yeah. I think you might include how the 
judge was uh, changed. OK, yeah, all right. <laughs> I agree with you, because that's an important part of the story. Uh, it may be a bit of a challenge to come up with that right now, but what could we say? Um, Who stepped down? He, he didn't step down. It was exactly how would we say? Well, you guys, you guys have the text over there, too. Maybe someone in chat sitting back there has rewritten this already. No. Come on, chat people. Give us some ideas. Uh, I mean, let's see. Uh, oh. This to go that long. Case was transferred, I guess. Okay, so let's use that terminology. Um, and let's say that um, the defendant's name is Derek Almena. So um, let's say that uh, I'll just put his initials here, but let's say it would be something like Derek Almena. Um, maybe say uh, thought that he had a deal oh, thought that he had a deal I'm, I'm looking through you know he was sentenced to nine uh, he could have gotten out after you know a certain length of time. So let's kind of round that off. Let's say Almena thought that he had a deal that could have that could see him released in three and a half years of after three and a half years of jail time. So Almena, uh, defendant Almena, uh, thought he had a deal. Could have seen him released. in as little as three and a half years, I guess. So um, I felt it really necessary, whoops, to get uh, the defendant's actual name in there. And, uh, and I wanted to get, you know, to give the listeners a sense of how short a time he was actually looking at serving, because I think that's something that people might say, whoa, that's not much for creating such a dangerous situation and so many people dying. And then I think we'd want to go with what Eric was saying, which was, you know, that uh, maybe we could go <laughs> running out of board. We could say, you know, but but the trial, you know, was transferred to another judge who appeared to be swayed by, uh, I don't know, <laughs> we'll, put a, we'll put something in there. Uh, by the uh, the survivors or the, the what would you say by uh, by the what would it be <laughs> I'm thinking of the family members who were so upset. What what could we say there? Okay, by the comments of victims family okay let's stop it there we're only partially on the way to adapting this for uh, to work well as radio and let's just time out what we've done here uh, so I'm just waiting for the clock and then I read it I'm gonna start here all right Lawyers for the defendants in the ghost ship trial argued Monday that the judge had cheated them out of a plea deal. Uh, defendant Almeida thought he had a deal uh, that could see, have seen him released from, uh, in as little as three and a half years. 
Uh, but the trial was transferred to another judge who appeared to be swayed by the comments of victims' families. That took 25. I have about 20 seconds to bring it around to um, sort of say he, he rejected the plea bargain. And the case will now be uh, argued during a hearing on November 2nd in Oakland. OK, he rejected the plea bargain. Uh, the defendant's lawyers have called foul, and the issue will now be argued during a hearing on November 2nd in Oakland. That would come in at about 45. We could massage it, make it better, of course, but we've got the essential. We've got, we've reorganized the facts a little bit to make it just a clearer narrative. And we've ended, because beginnings are really important, the lead is important, and the ending is important. So we end with, what is the next step in the story? What are we expecting to happen next, basically? Which very nicely, you know, the, again, the, the Chronicle has put that in there. But that's probably what we would end with. And even if you look down at the bottom of the Chronicle story, uh, the motion is expected to be argued in front of a third judge, not Kramer or Jacobson, when it's heard in November. So you know, we've reduced the complexity a great deal. Uh, which is necessary usually. And we've also kind of reorganized the story a little bit to put you know, the defendants in the, uh, in the driver's seat. So we'll look at this again on um, next uh, Thursday. We won't look at this story, but we'll look at you know, more generally the assignment. But the assignment that's due for September 11th is to take a couple of stories and um, strip from them the facts, and write up this type of short radio story. So you know, we did this in about half hour, 45 minutes, here, well, less than a half hour here. Um, so that's what I'll be asking you to do for September 11th. So you can see the assignment now if you want. Uh, but you know, a good thing to do would be maybe find a couple of stories that you could uh, take the facts from and work on. And uh, you know. Take this home with you. This would be a great source if you don't want to go looking in the Chronicle or something. But the Guardsman uh, is a really good uh, newspaper and, and has uh, good stories you can pull from. Okay, so uh, next time we meet up Tuesday, we're going to go over to the broadcasting club and check out the radio station and stuff. And then Thursday we'll discuss this further. Okay, thank you. <laughs> See you. Writing in front of everybody or writing as a group like that is not all that easy. So thanks for your indulgence.